and much less even worship you, Father, uh, freely, Lord. So thank you, God, that you still give us the liberty here, Lord. Uh, please be in the teaching today, God, and uh, I just pray, with Father, you please use this uh, teaching, Lord, to, uh, to give you the glory, Father, and just thank you, Lord God, so much for the brethren. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so thank you for coming to church. As you can tell, the pastor isn't here. It's a uh, tall white guy. Uh, so uh, today, uh, as the title says, it's a teaching on the consequences of sin. Now, uh, we all know what sin is, but sin is a very serious issue. It's a very serious topic. And, you know, th there's a lot of effects that it does on people. And some of you don't know how serious those effects are. So we'll be going over, as the title says, the consequences of sin. And some of you will understand how serious it is, the longevity that sin has as well. Yeah. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it tells us that whatever we sow, we will reap of that sowing. So I will point out some sins. So we got two right here, and then we also have a little mystery one, which we'll go at the end, and in doing so, hopefully enlighten you on how serious sin is, okay? And we're going to use the Bible, obviously, to point that out. So the first consequence we're going to look at is fornication or adultery, the consequence of fornication and adultery. Go to Genesis 19 and put your other hand on 2 Peter chapter 2. Genesis 19, 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, if you've been following pastors' uh, Genesis verse by verse study, for a year and a half now, uh, you might know this chapter already. So Genesis 19, look at verse 1. So before we begin, again, fornication is a sin that not only affects your body in terms of STDs and sexual diseases, but also your spiritual walk with God. It's a very serious sin. And it leads into other sins as well. So verse 1 it reads, in Genesis 19 it reads, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with the face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, unto your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. But he pressed upon them greatly. So Lot is really telling these two individuals, Please come into my house. And they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did break unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every corner. Now, before I go any further, all the women in this church, how terrified would you be to see a bunch of old, young guys around your home just randomly? Like, you know, they're probably drunk. They're probably, you know, uh, around roaming, seeing you. How terrified would you be? I'd be pretty terrified. Look at verse 5. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Now that knowing is in a sexual tone. It's not knowing and conversating. Okay? And if you look at verse 24, this is the result of basically what they were trying to do. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. God will bring down fire and brimstone, basically hell, damnation on people who do this kind of, uh, this kind of wickedness. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, it reads, And delivered just Lot, well actually we'll go to verse 6 for context. So in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those after should live ungodly. So they were an example unto us to show us what happens if we live ungodly based off their nature. Verse 7, it reads, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing... And hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You will be so vexed in the spirit by this, simply by hearing and listening to it. Yeah. If you go to Romans 1, Romans 1, verse 27. Romans 1, verse 27. I'm reading it for time's sake. Uh, it reads, and likewise also the men. Okay, this is the men. Leaving the natural use of the woman. So what's natural to be, the man should, should be with is the woman. Yeah. Burn their lust one toward another. So now men are, are craving each other. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. God sees it as an error. It's not supposed to be man with man, woman with woman. It's man with woman and woman with man. So that's clearly what the Bible says. If you get mad at me, then tough luck. Uh, go to Exodus. Exodus 34 and Exodus 20. Exodus 34 and Exodus 20.
God is very, very uh, straightforward with his sin. He's not going to play, uh, you know, a little footsie on that. Yeah. So he's going to call it as it is, and if you don't like it, then, God, I, I don't know what yeah, to say to you. <laughs> You're in the wrong church, I guess. Go to a uh, charismatic church then. Uh, go to Exodus 34, verse 13. Uh, it reads, but you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Okay, so it's talking about uh, no covenant with inhabitants, basically, is what this is talking about. But thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. That's right, we serve a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Verse 16. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. So God clearly sees us as whoring around when you put something over him. Go to Exodus 20, verse 5. And this is very serious because there's a repercussion for that. It's more than just doing the sin. You're going to get something in return from this. Exodus 20, verse 5. Exodus 20, verse 5. It doesn't affect you. It affects, it affects all something else. Exodus 20, verse 5, it reads, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. <clears throat> uh, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So once again, God says, I'm jealous. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I forgot to mention this. So the first one was city that loved too much, met with fire and brimstone. The second one is after whoring with other gods, the family line is corrupted, and it is corrupted. You know, even though God says it's up, it's up to the fourth generation, that doesn't mean it won't stop from there. Yeah. He'll still remember it. Now, that should terrify you if you're messing around with something that puts above yeah. our God. Right. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, obviously, it can be more than just fornication and, and sexual, but the, the, the overall uh, point is that God sees it as whoring around. Yeah. If that's not straightforward, then get a dictionary. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it reads, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. That's disgusting. Verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed, might be taken away from among you. So they're not even upset about what he just did. Yeah. Not even the elders are rebuking this man. Mm-hmm. Isn't that crazy that even when the men are supposed to be sitting there being leaders, they're not doing anything. They're condoning it. Look at verse 5. This is what should have happened. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, which is what you, they should have done, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now this person still saved, uh, He's not burning in hell, but that's not what the verse is saying, but simply that he can be, uh, get that sin right. Because sometimes there's some things that you should just not allow at all. Yeah. Go to First, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, a brother destroys his testimony and the church for his wicked desire. Because what do you think is going to happen when people start hearing this? Like, oh man, like that guy, you know, he, he did this. And he goes to this church. Maybe the church is the same way. Maybe the church members do the same stuff. If they're not, you know, getting mad at him, then I guess they do the same thing. So why not we just go there? It could be a good time. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. It reads, For the will of God, even your sanctification, so even your sanctification is in this will, that you should abstain from fornication. Okay, so first one he mentions that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testify. You shouldn't fornicate because it is of God in your sanctification. That's, come on. That should be kind of obvious. If you're saved, you should kind of know that by doing any kind of sin, regardless of what it is, it's against God's will. Yeah. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I know I'm kind of like uh, uh, really fireballing a lot of this stuff, but it's based off time's sake. I really want to get this done. 
But again, it, it's to show you how serious God takes sin. Yeah, it's not like, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord, which you should be sorry for when you commit sin. But there is going to be some repercussions of it. God is gracious. He will, you know, suffer you for a while. But that doesn't mean he'll suffer you for all the time. Yeah, First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it reads, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sitteth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Modern people would hate this verse. Is it saying, you're not your own? Yeah. My body, my choice. No, 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 no. It's not your choice. It's God's decision on what you do with your life. Now, you can disobey it. You have the will to do that. You know, he gives us free will. But are you willing to lower yourself so he can be risen in you? So for that is the temple in you is defiled when you do that. I mean, you know that, right? You have a temple inside of you. You're saved. You have something very holy in you. That, and when you put something in there that's not clean and you make it unclean, that's on you. Go to Galatians 5. It's not, it's not somebody else's fault. It's not the devil's fault. The devil's supposed to tempt us, yes. But if you yield to that temptation, that's on you. I may be a little hard, but that's the truth. Galatians 5, verse 19. Galatians 5, verse 19. It reads, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. So right off the bat, the works of the flesh, the first two, are sexual. The, the, as soon as he mentions that, those are the first things he says, is that they're sexual. Now, if you're not able to see yourself, or let me step back. If you can't acknowledge what you're doing, then you're already too far gone with the sin. And that should terrify you. If Here today, regardless of what sin it is, it doesn't have to be fornication or adultery, but with any kind of sin, then you're really far gone, and you've got to get right with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to go back there real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So you are perceived and looked upon as sexual. That's pretty bad for a Christian. That's pretty sorry. Now, I just want to say this real quick. It's bad enough if you've been dealing with the same sin for five years, but it's even worse if you keep apologizing to God and keep apologizing to God and you don't have the actual mindset to change. If you don't have that, then you're basically saying a prayer that doesn't mean anything. If your heart's not in it, then you just said empty words, basically. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. <clears throat> know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. Absolutely God forbid. Now this is indoctrinal, but how I see it is this, is that if you take the bride of Christ, you're essentially making something that's pure and holy and you're turning it into the queen of Babylon. If that, if that, if you, that makes sense. So you take something that's, that's 100% supposed to be pure and then if you're tainting it with sin, it comes so distorted and so wicked that it becomes something else. Now, that's not, I'm not, that's not doctrinal. I'm just giving you an illustration of what sin can do. So, so that is, you make the members of Christ into a harlot, and God forbid you do that. Go to Genesis 34. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, um, but if you know this chapter, uh, this is a case of Shechem and Dinah. Um, a very wicked sin happened, right? You know, Shechem rapes Dinah, and uh, Simon and Levi, they end up go killing the whole city, they destroy everything that's in there, all the men, uh, all that. Now, the reason why that's relevant for today is that men are still capable of that. Yep. And you say, well, how is that possible? Well, all the husbands that are in here, or better yet, all the fathers that are in here. Imagine that your daughter got raped, okay? You found out where this person lives. You know exactly where the address is. You know exactly who to call, who to get, 
get X amount of weapons you need to go kill the person. Would you not do it? I'll, I'll, I'm not a father, but I, it's hard for me to say that I wouldn't. Because I know people personally that, that have had that happen to them, and it destroys them. Any kind of woman that went through that and is still able to trust men in general, that's a strong woman. Because right. at that point, how can you sit there and trust anybody? That's a man. I just I don't know how they're able to do that. You talk about willpower. Some men can't even handle a joke. Come on. And yet a woman can go through that and then still trust people. Man, God help us men. We're weak minded. We're no longer strong as we used to be. Well, we were no longer, uh, well, you know, we weren't really strong to begin with, but we can be strong with God. Yeah. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Now, forced fornication can death, absolutely. Most certainly that can happen. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 21. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21. It reads, Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the cleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. If it's not repented of right away, it'll be part of your manner. And that, essentially at that point, people can just know right off the bat that you are, are the type of person. Fornication will be part of your mannerisms. That's essentially what will happen. Go to Jude. No, sorry, go to 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, bless God, some of you went through a lot of stuff in life, absolutely, you know, before Christ, or maybe even during Christ, and you got a lot of victories. But just remember, God helped you through that stuff. And if you think you can't go through it, you, you have an almighty God with you. Yeah. Okay? Just stop and think that for a minute. The universe is big, right? Our God is bigger than that. And if he's on your side, don't you think you can get through it? Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters. First thing he mentions, the fornicator nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind. Verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Your inheritance will be taken from you. That should, that should really scare you. Now, you're still saved. You're still going to heaven. But you will lose things. You will lose things in heaven. Things that you could have won and gotten, but God's going to be, nope. You, you prefer the world than me. You're not getting it. I don't care how much you've done for me. The inheritance will be taken from you. Go to Jude 1. Well, obviously, there's only one chapter. Verse 7. Jude, verse 7, it reads, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, oh, i got to hurry, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Simply put, again, this is a sin. So if you're not saved, you're burning in hell for committing sin. Just want to be straightforward with that. Proverbs 2. All right, I got it right. Proverbs 2, verse 16. Proverbs 2, verse 16. I'm going to read it. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsake the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. This is mention of the whorish woman. And this woman brings death upon you. Okay, more than just physical diseases and ailments, but also your spiritual walk with God. That's going to get destroyed. Go to Proverbs 5. Proverbs 5, verse 11. And it's not just for man too, it's also for women. Proverbs 5, verse 11. It reads, And thou mourn the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. So for the 12th one is STDs, health issues, but more importantly, your spiritual walk. And number 13, testing God's patience will cost you something. That's what Proverbs is saying. You will lose something if you keep. As I mentioned 
earlier, but if you want a chance and, and take the risk that he's going to keep long suffering with you, then go ahead. Go but let me give you some advice. Don't do that. Just put on the blood. Just go along with your walk with God and don't look back. We tend to look back on what we've done and we focus on that and then we go back to the sin. No, just look forward. So that's the first one of fornication. Now the second one is violence. The second one is violence, the consequence of violence. Now, uh, brother, can we see it? Uh, let's see it a little bit. Is that good? Very good. Cool, sweet. So violence only begets more violence, as the saying goes. Man was not violent, okay? Man was supposed to be in walk in unison with, with, with God, walk yeah. in fellowship with God, never to be violent, never to be any of that. That's the byproduct of man. Look at Cain. Cain is a great example. God made us so we can have perfect unison with him. And any kind of violence you see on in the world, that's not God. Yeah. Okay, just right off the bat. That's that's of man. Right. Now the first one we'll look at is the crucifixion of Jesus. Now when you look at uh, that whole that whole scenario, it's mind-boggling to me cuz I I've had a really bad uh, 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 accident. I had like these uh, I had these scars and it co- comes from uh, barbed wire. And you know when it, when it cut through me, it was so painful, I couldn't even move. I was 11 years old. I literally fell down on my ground, uh, uh, onto the ground, and I was just screaming in pain. I couldn't move. I just felt like I was going to die, basically. And to think, in John 19, verse 1, it says they scourged Jesus. Okay, so they got whips, and they were ripping the flesh off of him. And the fact that he was able to get up from that and move and go up a hill and then get nailed to a cross... To me, that's mind-boggling because how can you possibly go through that amount of pain and still move? And then Matthew 27, verse uh, 30, it reads about the reed that they beat him with. Man is wicked beyond, beyond compare. You cannot compare anything to man when it comes to violence. And John 19, verse 2, the thorns crown on his head. The bloodiest beating was done by man under the Son of Man. That's how wicked violence can be. Violence can can hurt something that's holy. Go to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Genesis 6, verse 11. This is how God will will repay violence. Genesis 6, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Verse 13, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence among, uh, through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Violence can get so out of hand that God himself will destroy the planet. Yeah. He'll have enough of that. Because again, God, doesn't, God isn't a violent person. Or he isn't, uh, he, he's not a God that goes straight to violence. He wants everything to be, okay, perfect. This, this is perfect. This is peaceful. Perfect, 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 perfect. There's no there's not, he, he doesn't want turmoil, okay? We want turmoil because we like, we like the things that are negative. We like things that are evil. You know, what, uh, what's that uh, verse? It says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's exactly what we want. God doesn't want that. Go to Acts 17. Go to Acts 17. Acts 17. Now, this is the preaching at Thessalonica, if you read Acts 17, or I've read Acts. Acts 17. Now this is this should really open your eyes on this how wicked this sin is. Acts 17 verse 5. It reads, "But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain loose fellows of the baser sort." So basically, that's taking like a homeless guy off the streets here, who's probably disabled, and they're basically dragging him with them. Okay, and gathered a company. So this is a huge amount of people. And set all the city up in uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out of the people, uh, out to the people. This is probably one of the most wicked things violence can do. Group, think. That is probably something that is so wicked beyond you can possibly imagine, because. 
You can do it in the name of, oh, we're doing it for you. Well, that's why we're going to destroy all these communities, and we're saying it for this particular race, because we love you guys, but we're going to destroy your community. We're going to destroy all these businesses that you had for years. And even though we're doing it for your name, uh, don't, don't say we're not doing it for you, because then we'll call you a, an Uncle Tom. Like, do you understand how ridiculous that is? Yeah. Violence will get people that are not even violent to do violence. Imagine a group of people that got weapons, guns, and they're telling you, they're pointing in your face saying, you come with us. Are you going to say no? Because you're going to be so terrified of these people that are going to do anything. If they're willing to openly do that, then you best believe they're going to attack you. And so much more as Christians, right, because pretty soon that's going to happen here. And so, and when it does happen, you know, hopefully we'll have the grace to get through it, just like how the martyrs did how they went through all that craziness and they were able to get through it and suffer for Jesus Christ. You know, hopefully we can go through that as well and get some of that rewards. Go to Psalms 11. No, sorry, not Psalms 11. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. The reason why for me that one's so wicked is because I've met people and I've known people that are so good at manipulating people to do that. And it's an, you, you'll get somebody who not only should not be fighting, but they don't even want to fight. But the person who knows how to manipulate that person to have them do the violent act, I, I don't know. For me, it's just, it's, for me, it's wicked. It's just absolutely insane that someone can do that. And people say, oh, I'm not a bad person. It's like, are you serious? Matthew 27, verse 24. Matthew 27, verse 24. It reads, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be upon us and on our children. Violence can make people who are in authority, who should do the right thing, who should do the thing that is not only good for the people, but is good for everybody. They'll do the exact opposite because they cave into peer pressure. Because they see in the, in the masses that they'll sit there and they will do something to them that they don't want to do, but rather not doing something that's right, they cave in and do something that's bad. That's All because of people are willing to do something against them, whether it be killing them, beating them, uh, you know, torturing them. It's crazy. Go to Psalms 11. Psalms 11. Psalms 11, verse 5. There's a reason why God hates violence. And he hates those that love violence. Psalms 11, verse 5, it reads, The Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. So automatically he calls you wicked if you love violence. That's pretty straightforward. Go to Proverbs 28. I'm just going to nail the, the coffin. Proverbs 28. Verse 17. Proverbs 28, verse 17. Okay. Proverbs 28, verse 17. It, and this is in the context of Psalms 11, verse 5. Proverbs 28, verse 17, it reads, A man that doeth violence to the blood of any person shall flee to the pit. Let no man stay him. That's where you're going to go. So the fourth one was those in authority can make bad decisions. Okay, those who are, should be doing things that are right are leaders. That should be looking after for our own, our, our, for our good, but they don't. They look after their own constituents, but not for the will of the people. Verse uh, number five, what we just went through, God is of peace, so a violent man gets the pit. That's exactly what he'll get. He'll get damnation. And even if you're saved, you're still going to go through some kind of crazy thing that you don't want to go through. I don't know what it will be, but I have a feeling that God, if you're a violent Christian, you're going to suffer for some things from that. Go to Psalms 140. Psalm 140. Psalms 140, verse 1. Psalms 140, verse 1. It reads, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Perceive me from the violent man. Again, he, David's saying anyone that's violent is an evil person. It goes back to being wicked. Verse 2. Which imagine mischiefs in their heart continually. Are they gathered together for war? They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adders, 
poison under their lips. Selah. A violent man will imagine mischief. And not only for others, but for himself and his mind. If you've ever met people that are so violent that they just randomly just start going berserk, they're, in, they're not in their right mind because all they're thinking constantly, every single day, every single minute, every single second is, oh, I want to wanna knock them out, I want to knock them out. If you don't have that, uh, guys will tell me when I used to grow up, they hear this little small voice in the back of their head saying, go get them, go get them, go get them. Do it, do it. That's crazy. It's, it's, there's no rest. It's constant warfare with, with that person. Proverbs 1. That's why it's so sad when you see uh, some of our veterans that have PTSD. That stuff is crazy, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have some veterans in my family, and it's just amazing how the hell they go through in their own mind. And then people sit there and they say PTSD because their parents pronounce their wrong pronouns. Are you kidding me? That stuff irritates me. Proverbs 10. Uh, sorry, not Proverbs 10. Uh, Proverbs 1, verse 10. Proverbs 1, verse 10, it reads, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lie wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. This sounds like a group of people we should be hanging with. Uh, verse 14, Cast in thy long among us. Let us all have one purse. Now, violence is also associated with robbery. Because here's the thing. Let's say that you're really good at fighting, okay? But you're not good enough to do it professionally. What else are you going to do with that tendency? Okay? I won't name names, but I know guys that, that got into that. They make a lot of money, but now they're in prison. That doesn't really help you. It's short money. It's not long money. Go to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. It's amazing how your mind can play tricks on you and deceive you. Psalm 73, verse 6. Psalm 73, verse 6. Psalm 73, verse 6, it reads, Therefore pride compassed them about as a... So... Where are we at? Where are we at? So, uh, six, okay, the one before uh, about robbery. Violent people are lost in violence, okay? Their mind is completely warped in that, which is sad. Seven, violence can be used to rob people, which is true. And eight, your appearance will look violent. I don't know if you've met people, we just look at them, like, right off the bat. You're like, that person probably has gone a lot of fights. Like, they got a bust up lip, they got missing teeth. Like their eyes are all baggy, or they're wearing like cut up pants. Like you can just tell that they're up to something bad. Go to Matthew 5. Go to Matthew 5. Oh Lord, I gotta hurry up. Pastor, don't hurt me. Pa- uh, Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 38. Matthew 5, verse 38. I'm gonna read it. Uh, ye have heard that have been said, an eye for an eye and two for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. For whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You get back what you dish out. If you throw something at somebody, you better get it back in return. But better yet, why don't you just not do it? Okay. Isn't it better for you just to take the hit and then suffer for the causes of Christ yep. than to lose out a big reward in heaven? Come on. Come on. I mean, let's be honest. If we really believe that there is a heaven... Okay, and we really believe there's going to be a rapture. Wouldn't it be very beneficial for you as a soldier of Jesus Christ to get something like this? If God said, oh, wow, okay, so you, okay, you actually not only took a punch, but you still kept witnessing to that person that hit you. All right, here's some gold. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. You know, there are times where, and during Christ, where I actually, you know, I had to, like, do a personal prayer to God and be like, God, get me through this because if this person touches me, I'm going to knock him out and I'm not going to stop. So please get this person away from me. Whatever you have to do, just have this person stop. And then it's always somebody who's drunk usually. And, you know, they, I don't know if you handle with drunks, but they, they go in waves. You know, they'll, they'll focus on you for like five, 20 seconds and then they'll just wander off. So thank God that the guy wandered off, but it's real, man. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 31. 
Envy thou not the oppressor and choose not of his ways, for the forward is abomination of the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is the house of the wicked, but he blessed the habitation of the just. Those that take things by force violently are an abomination to God. Now, that word abomination isn't mentioned that much in the Bible. So if he mentions that word and it isn't mentioned that much, you should take notice of that. First Peter, sorry, not first Peter, Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10. I might have to skip some of these. Uh, yeah, I might have to skip some of them. Proverbs 10, verse 11. It reads, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. Amen, that's true. You should be an encouragement to people, helping them, minister them, give them advice, spiritual advice, or life advice, whatever you need to help them, especially if they're a brethren. Um, if it's a lost person, then you can lead them into salvation. Verse 11, But violence cover the mouth of the wicked. Can I ask you a question? Does your mouth always talk about violence? Is it not talking about the things of God? So, you're an abomination in God's eyes, and if your violent conversation is over godly conversation, then who are you as a Christian? You're a violent Christian. You're an evil Christian. But in God's eyes, go to, we're going to skip 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, but that's essentially telling us that you will lose out on blessings. So blessings will depart from you. That's what uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4, verse 14. Proverbs 4, verse 14, it reads, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it. Turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief. Sleep is taken away, unless they cause them to fall. That to me is actually uh, hard because uh, in my family, I have a lot of, uh, uh, my father's side, there are a lot of raging alcoholics. So loss of sleep, no rest unless you fight. And that for me is basically the best description of those kind of people because the only way for them to get any kind of sleep is to do two things. One, either they have to really hurt somebody to where they finally fulfill that kind of, the, the, that kind of um, fulfillment. Or two, you have to knock them out or choke them out for them to get sleep. Those are the only two things. Or they knock themselves out. That's, those are the only two ways they can get sleep and rest. Uh, we'll, we'll skip the uh, 14, but it's a sin. talks about how violence is also a sin. So that's in Obadiah 1.10 if you want to write that down. Obadiah 1.10 talks about that you'll be cast off. Now, you're a saved Christian. You're not cast off into hell, but you definitely be cast off from the church if you're a violent person. I don't want you here if you're threatening people. If you're threatening people, and it's not my, my call to make, but I'm pretty sure if Pastor was like seeing a brother or a sister violently hurting another brother and sister, I, bet, I guarantee you, he would tell you, you get one more chance, and at that point, you're done. Because why would you want somebody here to mess something like this up? Yeah. Yeah. It's been, what, how long? Over 10 years that he's been in the ministry, and you come in here, and you start doing something stupid because you get mad at whatever the person said, or they took your seat, or they took your parking spot, or they took your meal? Like, are you serious? You deal with people that work that take your Lord's name in vain, but you, as soon as somebody here in the church does something bad to you, then that justifies your violent behavior? Dude, come on, come on, that's good. God help you, man. So, last one. Question mark. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, man. Thank God I don't watch sports anymore. Fear. That's probably one of the biggest ones. Fear. As a saved Bible Christian, we are not supposed to be the spirit of fear, but the spirit of a sound mind. That's what God gives us. And when you take that away, you lose your peace. Okay? And it causes you to be in a state of panic constantly and a lot more. Go to Psalms 32. Psalms 32, and put your other hand in Romans 8. All right, I got about 18 minutes. Psalms 32 and Romans 8. We'll start at uh, Psalms 32. Boom. Do, 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 do. Psalms 32, 
Verse 3, it reads, When I kept silence, my bones was waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For the day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture was turned in the drought of summer. David has mentioned that his bones are so shaken from his iniquity. He's mentioning that. that that's when God's hand is on him because what he did, he was so scared that his bones were just shaking inside of him. But David did right. He confessed to God his sin, what he did. Now go to Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 15. That's how you're able to get that fear away from you once you confess to God. David is a really good example to show you how you should live for God. Because he's what? He's a man after God's own heart. You should probably look into that. Romans 8, verse 15, it reads, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God gave us a spirit that frees us from bondage. When you, when you try to, and, and again, I know you guys go through your own personal things, and you, know, you go through a lot of stuff, but you do realize when you do that, you put yourself back in bondage. You're free from bondage, but then the moment that you start fearing again over something that God gave you the victory over, you got yourself back into those chains. Bondage. All right, hopefully I spelled that. I'm not illiterate. Uh, all right, sweet. My handwriting is, but that's okay. Bondage. Back on. Thank you, brother. Oh, yeah, definitely you, but... Uh, I'm joking, brother. I'm sorry. Division of the... All right, 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. Uh, Lord, help me. Uh, 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. I love our church, man. I like, I like you guys. You know, uh, Pastor Lyman, he mentioned something in the blowout 2019. He said that, you know, I love everybody but I don't like everybody. It's very rare that when you're in a place where you like everybody, or you love everybody, and you like everybody. That's, true. That's super rare. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it reads, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Yes. All right, come on, there we go. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect, but uh, he that is not made perfect in love. There we go. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it reads, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has given us the spirit that not only gives us power, love, and a sound mind, okay, but freedom from fear. That same fear is perfect. And when you have fear in your life, you're not trusting in what gave you that freedom. Okay. So freedom is at stake. Stake. Three. Go to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. Numbers 13. Verse 30. Numbers 13, verse 30. It reads, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. We were all well able to overcome it. But the men that went up from him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land in which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. Verse 33, And there, and there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come to the giants, we come up with the giants, and we were in our in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in the, in their sight. The people were more afraid of the visual, the physical things that they can see, rather than what God can help them to get through yeah, those things. Good, yeah. Now, again, like I just want to iterate this. I'm not trying to sit here and, and be like, you bunch of heretics, how dare you not trust in God in all your life? Like you're bunch of demon-possessed Christians is not what I'm saying. But again, if there is something in your life that you know God is helping you with and he's been showing you, hey, dummy, I'm giving you this help to do it and you don't trust in it, then that's on you. Fearing. 
rocks. Gods. Power. Four. Number four. Uh, Numbers 14. Numbers 14, verse 27. Numbers 14, verse 27, it reads, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken to mine ears, so will I do to you. <coughs> uh, where am I at? Where am I at? Uh, there we go, 29, yeah. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number from 20 years, 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. The Lord will have enough of your fear-mongering and terror to where he will straight out call you evil. Okay? And he'll just be like, all right, I'm done. Go ahead, wallow in that fear. Go ahead. Um, until you realize that that fear is completely powerless in your life, and I'm the one that can give you the victory, until you realize that, go ahead and wallow in it. So that's, put you, go to Mark 14 as I write this down. So that would basically be, we'll have enough to fear monger. Lord, we'll have enough all right 20 minutes perfect all right oh i gotta get there too mark 14 mark 14 look at verse 66 it reads and as peter was beneath in the palace there cometh one of the maids of the high priest and when she saw peter warring himself he looked upon him and said, Aren't thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth? And sometimes are people like, Man, there's something about you, bro. Like, you're not cursing, you're not drinking, you're not like like why are you like you're you're kind of different. Why are you here? But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand or what you thou sayest. And he went on to the porch, and the cock crew. And the maid saw him again and began to say to him to the stood by, This is one of them. And he nodded again, and a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. He began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew, and Peter, uh, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And, he went th- and when he thought thereon, he wept. Fear will cause you to deny the Lord in front of many people, those that you could potentially witness to and lead to to salvation. Even a big shot like Peter can suffer this. You know, bless God, we have a lot of people here that are very soul-minded. We have a lot of people here in this church that are constantly wondering about souls. we got Brother Jonathan in South Korea, who sounds like he's going to be the next missionary there. Um, But fear can make you do something that not only will get you out of the will of God, but it will not uh, allow you to do the spiritual work that God wants you to do. Go to Matthew 14. Matthew 14. I don't know about you, but every time I see Brother Jonathan on, on the chat, I'm like, man, dude, this is awesome, man. He's witnessing to young and old, man. To the uh, Buddhist people, too. It's crazy. Matthew 14, verse 29. Matthew 14, verse 29. It reads, And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore dost thou doubt? Verse 32, it reads, And when they came unto the ship, the wind ceased. Now, when you take off your eyes off the Lord and you start focusing on, everything around the world. Let's be honest. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening right now. Yeah. There's The rapture could happen tomorrow. I don't know. Like It could happen or may not happen, but regardless, there's still there's wars going on. People are dying from illnesses, ailments, besides of the, the blank thing. Um, but we're not supposed to focus on that. Yeah. We've got to focus on him. And when you don't focus on him, then all basically what happens to Peter, and God bless Peter, bro. He's gone through a lot of stuff, and yeah, we use him as illustrations. But 
I'm thankful that it's him and not me, because if it's me, it would have been a lot worse. I probably would have been cursing at the Lord, like, like, how could you let me get down to this water? At least Peter knew, like, right off that he was in the wrong. Mark 9. Mark 9. And it shows how gracious God is, that he still let Peter go with him. After seeing him walk on water, doing all these miracles, he still let him go with him. And that's how gracious God is and the Lord is. How many times have you failed him and yet he still has you here, yeah. still working? Yeah. You know, you'll go to sleep and like, God, I'm sorry. You know, if you took me home, I totally understand. But he doesn't. That means he still has use for you. Mark 9, verse 31, it reads, For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is called. And I forgot to write those down. <laughs> and he said, uh, He shall rise the third day. But they understood but they understood not the saying and were afraid to ask him. Sometimes, okay, you got to hear this now. Sometimes you'll be so fearful that you'll ask people to pray for you, unspoken or whatever it is, and bless God that's spiritual to have people pray for you. But there are some times you will not ask God that question that you have that you've been wanting him to answer, but you haven't, you haven't asked him yet because you're afraid of what the answer will be. Right. There are times where you have to ask that question. You don't want it to ask it, but guess what? The Spirit knows you need to ask it. He knows you need to ask it. He knows what you want, but do you know what you need? And if you know what you need, then you've got to ask Him for it. He's amazing. He's an amazing God, but you've got to ask in order to get. Go to Proverbs 29 and Matthew 10. I've got to write this stuff down. So Mark 14, that was denying. Uh, denying. God. Six. Got to write this down real quick. Fear. Greater. Than faith. Pardon for my horrible handwriting. Uh, and then. Question. Not answered. There we go. Oh, I hope I have enough room for this. Uh, Proverbs 29. You guys are already there. I'm not. Matthew 10. Put your hand on Matthew 10. Look at verse 28 from Matthew 10, verse 28. Proverbs 29, verse 25. Proverbs 29, verse 25. It reads, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Matthew 10, Matthew 10, verse 28. Matthew 10, verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The fear of man, yes, can can scare you. I, I grant you that. That can happen. But that should not be over God. Because here's the thing. Proverbs keeps telling us the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge, beginning of wisdom. That's good. That's the good kind of fear. But when you fear man, that's distorting. That is completely yeah. deceiving. There is a good, healthy fear when it's concerning God. Yeah. And you should fear God always. But when you fear man, you're proceeding something over God. Go to John 14, John 14, verse 27. John 14, yeah, John 14, verse 27. John 14, verse 27. Hope you guys are already there. John 14, verse 27. Super quiet in here. Verse 27. 
John 14, verse 27, it reads, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let be afraid. Are you afraid of losing your worldly possessions? Are you afraid of losing something that not only is it temporal, but it will probably most likely deteriorate in value the moment you purchase it? When you get something in heaven, that never deteriorates. The value of what you get in heaven will never lose its value. Because you have an almighty God giving it to you. And don't you think when an almighty God gives you something, it will be eternal? It will last to the test of time? Now, if it's something physical, then obviously that won't last. But still, if God gives you something personally in heaven, that will last. Go to Psalms 34. Psalms 34. Now, also, just on that topic for John uh, 14, verse 27, by having fear, that will also prohibit you from going to the next step in your Christian walk. Maybe that, that next step you want to attain. That, that, that one step where you're able to finally go soul win or finally be able to have the courage to say, hey, preacher, I want to be able to preach. Can you teach me? Psalm 34, verse 4. Psalm 34, verse 4. Psalm 34 and verse 4. We're almost done. It reads, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. David clearly says that when he sought for the Lord, God gave, he took away all his fear. When you don't ask God to help you, you have your fears with you. It will stay with you. It will be in your mind. You'll constantly wonder about it. You'll be in fear always. But if you let God take care of it, you'll be fine. But if you don't, you'll simply wallow in your fear. You'll do a woe is me attitude all the time. You'll feel like everybody's against you when no one really isn't against you. Everybody's for you, especially here. But if you let fear just keep wandering in your mind, I mean, imagine this. Fear is so powerful that it makes you doubt God's power. That should terrify you how deadly that thing is. Proverbs 12. Go to Proverbs 12. So 9. Fear, here we go. Possessions. Fearful. Fear is over God. And eleven. Man, my handwriting is terrible. All right, Proverbs twelve, verse twenty-five, and then we're done. It reads, "Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it to stoop." but a good word maketh it glad. And Proverbs 25, verse 25, it tells us about, uh, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Maybe the reason why you're so fearful is because you haven't heard the word of God or read the word of God in a long time or prayed to God. And that's why when you feel like you're going to church, you feel like God is so far away from you, like a far country. And that's because of fear. There's something in you that makes you fearful and that you're not able to get to God and get a hold of God. I'll, I'll just say this. If that's the case, then during the preaching, get on the altar and ask God to help you with that. Help him to get you through the kind of pain or whatever it is that's causing you to be doubtful of his power. Now, I hope this was eye-opening to you. Uh, I hope this was helping you to understand the consequences of fear. There may be a part two. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, God, so much for the gathering of the saints. And uh, thank you, God, for helping me to get on time. Uh, well, partially a little bit. Um, but thank you, Father, so much that uh, you were in the message, Lord. And thank you, God, that I was not in it. I thank you, God, so much that um, it wasn't of, of my doing, Lord, Father. Whatever we get from this book, Lord, it's, it's from your wisdom, Lord God. And we thank you, God, so much that we can have a God that can give us a little bit of his knowledge. And we please just be with the next service, Lord. And we ask you things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.